Okay, welcome everyone to our session. Uh, this is thematic session 3A, to make sure you're in the right room, prevention through multi-sectoral and integrated approaches, education and child protection. Um, so welcome, it's great to have you all with us and we're really looking forward uh, to the discussions today. Um, one uh, quick housekeeping item, we wanted everybody in the session, if they have a preferred language for breakout room, and this will only be possible if the numbers are, are big enough, to please simply add the language beside your name. So when you rename yourself, you go to the little three dots on your picture of your video in your, um, in your screen on Zoom, and you just add an EN for, or leave it for English, add an SP for Spanish, FR for French, or an AR for Arabic. Um, and if the numbers are large enough, we'll accommodate a breakout room um, with a certain language. So thank you. Um, you could add any questions in the chat if you have that. So again, my name is Laura Lee, and I'm the COVID-19 focal point for the Alliance presently. And I'm really excited to be working on this topic. And so today we have three awesome presentations from uh, individuals in three different corners of the world. Um, the first will be Camilla Fabri from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. It's not based in Tanzania, but we'll speaking, be speaking about a project in Tanzania. The second is Toby Mbaya from Plan International. Allah, 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 Allah. And the third is Ala Raja Mugrabir from Huras Network in Syria. And so we'll go through um, each of these presentations. So we wanted to mention that pillar four in the CPMS, the minimum standards for child protection and humanitarian action, is all about standards to working across sectors. Please check out the, the website, um, the, the, the Alliance website, to learn more about uh, how the community is committed to working in this area. And it's also an exciting new area um, in the next few years that will be of specific focus in the strategy. And so we just wanna flag this and just talk about how important this is. So today we'll be talking about education and child protection, but of course this spans across other sectors as well. And there's a great uh, 10 minute video on the website that flags this as well and highlights a little bit more about the importance of integration. Okay, now we have a Mentimeter question for you all. And so Katrina will put in the chat the link. The question is an integrated approach to child protection programming involves designing and implementing programs with child protection in one or more sectors too. And here you can select the choices. So if everybody can go to the link in the chat. So the options are prevent abuse, neglect, exploitation and violence against children. Ensure quality services, promote children's development, rights, and well being, and build on the cooperation, outcomes, and impact of other sectors. And the final is all of the above. So please select your answer. <laughs> and we can see the answers coming onto the screen. Um, most people chose all of the above, which is correct. <laughs> thank you so much, Katrina. Katrina is our producer today. And thank you for participating in that poll. So that just highlights some of the important factors around integration of multiple sectors. Um, so some of our presenters today will have um, breakout rooms. And so we do... Um, ask that when you're in the breakout room, it would be great if you put your video on and try to engage um, with the colleagues there. They'll just be short discussions. So it's a wonderful time to have a smaller group discussion. Um, before we launch into our first speaker, if everyone 
who's comfortable put on their video for one minute. I just have a quick question. How many cups of coffee or tea have you had today? Just show with your fingers. This may be showing of if which part of the world we're in. <laughs> Honey, zero. I can't believe it. It's early here, so I'm just on my first. Okay, great. Thank you for that. And it's lovely to see all of your faces. Um, so now I'm going to introduce our first speaker, which is Camilla Fabri, and we're delighted to have her with us. And um, so, as I said, Camilla is from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, she's a research fellow with the Gender Violence and Health Center. Um, her research interests lie at the intersection of development, behavioral and health economics with a focus on development and evaluation of interventions to prevent violence against children and adolescents. Her current work includes the evaluation of school-based interventions to reduce teacher violence in a refugee camp in Tanzania, as well as, as safe studies, um, schools study to create safe and child-friendly schools in Zimbabwe. Um, she conducts research on issues related to child protection, health, and the links between health exploitation and trafficking. So welcome, Camilla. We're excited to have you with us. Thank you, Laura. Um, nice to meet everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, so as Laura mentioned, I'm going to um, talk a bit about a study that we did in Yaragusu refugee camp, um, evaluating uh, violence prevention intervention in schools. Um, just a few words uh, about the setting of the study. So um, Nyaragusa refugee camp is one of three camps uh, located in the Kigoma region in Tanzania that you see um, up there on the map, very close to the border, border uh, with Burundi and DRC. Uh, the camp was established in the late 90s um, so um, to host the Congolese um, refugees. Um, and uh, over the last 10 years, it's been hosting uh, Burundian refugees as well. So we're talking about a protracted um, crisis with many refugees having lived uh, in the camp for um, many decades now. Um, so in the um, humanitarian and, and refugee context, as um, I assume most people in this, in the, this room will, will know, um, schools are um, a very important um, institution and, and setting um, because they not only offer um, children an opportunity to, to learn and play, but they also um, um, have a protection, a protection role and offer um, children who have uh, um, histories of, of trauma and, and conflict, um, a, safe, a safe space in which they can sort of um, regain a sense of normality, um, start a recovery process from, from that trauma, traumatic experiences, and, and build aspirations. Um, however, we also know that um, schools are an environment where children may experience violence. If we can get to the next slide, <laughs> thank you. Um, we also know that schools are an environment where um, children may experience violence, um, and in refugee and humanitarian settings, um, this risk of violence for children is even higher than in a more stable context. Um, and from the um, ample um, literature on this, we know that um, various factors that um, characterize um, humanitarian settings um, contribute to this, this increased um, risk of violence. And, and they include uh, overcrowding, not only at a camp um, level, but also within the schools and within classrooms, a general lack of, of security, uh, various forms of um, resource constraints, and generally um, weak protective, but also referral, referral systems and, and service provision. Um, so this, uh, these, these various factors contribute to um, um, creating um, um, risky risky situations for uh, for students um, while while in school. So um, just to to get us started and and do a bit of a 
uh, group brainstorm, um, I wanted to ask you um, a question. Um, as you, you see a list here of what we know are, are some of the main drivers of violence um, for, um, for, for students. Um, and I wanted to ask you what you think are the main drivers of teacher violence in this and other humanitarian context. And I think you should have a link in the chat box where you can um, express your vote. Yeah, the vote's there. I'll just stop sharing the presentation and share the screen for you. Thank you. Oops. So if you haven't done that yet, um, I think you can press, you can go to the link in the chat um, to um, select which are the main drivers of, of teacher violence in, in your view. So this looks, um, this, this looks uh, this looks fa fairly correct for uh, for this specific context. Um, as we all know, social norms um, that um, support and 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 contribute to the um, to to the continuation of, of violence um, as a, as a form of a, of deep discipline are are an important factors. But in these settings, um, stress levels um, and other resource constraints are also important um, triggers um, of violence. Um, and while violence can be uh, perpetrated as a normalized uh, behavior, um, it can also uh, um, um, be perpetrated and can occur impulsively. Um, and these, uh, um, in these contexts specifically, source stress and, and, uh, and overcrowding um, are particularly important triggers, um, triggers of violence. Um, so this is great. This is uh, uh, obviously all of these are are, are common um, drivers of violence. But I'm glad to see that the that the the two the blue social norm and stress sort of um, peaked um, quite a bit as um, here. Um, I think we can return to the um, to the slide. Thanks, Katrina. So. Um, what we knew when we um, when we started the study is exactly what you pointed out that uh, we knew that many um, existing risk factors existed, but we also uh, really wanted to um, focus on how stress um, and uh, um, impulsive use of violence um, um, took place in uh, in, uh, in, uh, in in this context, um, and that's sort of the hypothesis that we um, that we started from. Um, when we started designing this, uh, what we know as the, the, the what we call the PVAC study, um, which uh, um, was a, a study to assess the effectiveness of a school-based intervention uh, to prevent violence um, from teachers to students um, that we called um, empathy, and that I'm going to describe in a, in a few seconds. So what we did to assess the effectiveness of this um, intervention was to design a cluster randomized control trial. Um, where each school was um, represented a cluster. All 27 schools, um, primary and secondary schools in the camp participated. Um, they were randomly assigned to either receive the empathy intervention or to a control arm. Um, throughout the course of the study, we conducted um, uh, three rounds of surveys. Um, and when we mean, uh, when we say cross-sectional surveys, um, we mean that um, we randomly selected the sample of teachers and students at each time point. So um, because of the existing um, repatriation and resettlement efforts uh, ongoing within Yarugutsu, we were worried that um, we would not be able to follow um, a cohort of the same individuals over time. So instead, uh, we took random samples of teachers and students at three uh, time points. We did a baseline in late uh, 2018, a midline survey in uh, the spring of 2019, and an endline um, in uh, February, January, February 2020, just before the, the COVID pandemic started. Um, 
the, the empathy intervention was implemented uh, between baseline and midline uh, at the beginning of 2019. So our midline um, survey was a, um, was a measurement that took place right at the end of the intervention while we saw our endline survey as a, a longer term follow up of, uh, to, to look at sort of sustained um, effects of the intervention. Um, our primary outcome were, uh, was a um, student self-reported experiences of physical violence from teachers um, in the past week. And we also included measure that at midline. And uh, we also included a, a number of uh, secondary outcomes, uh, which included um, the same outcome, but this time measured at end line, um, self-reported um, experiences of, um, of um, emotional violence uh, perpetrated by, by teachers measured both at midline and end line. Um, and then we also um, looked at uh, um, student depressive symptoms and um, student school attendance, which were also outcomes we believed would be uh, likely affected by the um, empathy intervention. So um, the empathy intervention was uh, um, uh, created um, by the International Rescue Committee in collaboration with the Behavioral Insights Team um, and was uh, um, designed um, using uh, principles and insights from cognitive uh, behavioral therapy. Um, it, the intervention um, was uh, um, implemented at the school level and all teachers within intervention schools um, participated um, in, in empathy. Teachers were divided in, uh, in, uh, in groups and uh, um, each, all groups of teachers um, received um, various activities. So first they um, attended um, 12 peer-led group sessions. Um, these group sessions, when we say they were peer-led, this means that they were uh, not externally facilitated, um, but they were facilitated by teachers themselves. Um, following um, the content um, of, uh, of a booklet that was designed by the, the International Rescue Committee. And through uh, uh, these, uh, these sessions, uh, teachers engaged in a series of activities. Um, they included uh, empathy building exercises, a number of reflection activities where teachers would um, have the opportunity to think and discuss about their own experiences of violence, their values and strength, but also discuss the challenges that they were facing um, in the school and in the classroom. Um, they would learn uh, um, a number of self-regulation techniques to learn how to manage their stress levels um, and their own emotions. Because um, as I mentioned, um, we, we knew from previous, uh, previous research that um, teachers in this context reported very high levels of stress um, and, and a poor ability to, to, um, to self-regulate their, their reactions and, and emotions. Um, and finally, an important component of the of the intervention was um, uh, that teachers would learn uh, various uh, alternative disciplinary methods and the classroom management strategies that, that would uh, um, help them manage very uh, very large um, classrooms. In this context, in some of the low grades uh, of primary schools, we have a teacher to pupil ratio of uh, uh, one to 200, 250. So can you imagine how stressful and uh, chaotic it can be for a teacher to manage more than 200 children and, and teach them um, something uh, valuable that they can take home. So obviously teachers are um, subject to a lot of stress um, uh, in, this, in this context. Um, outside these face-to-face um, um, -face, um, sessions, teachers were also given an, uh, various homework assignments that included primarily home and classroom practice of the various strategies and techniques that they were learning uh, during the, 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 group, uh, the group sessions. And finally, the intervention had a social support um, component um, whereby uh, teachers, each teacher would nominate a supporter who would be another peer teacher um, who would act as a, as a mentor, as a friend throughout this uh, long process of change. So you see that the intervention mixed uh, on one side new strategies both to manage stress but also to manage the classroom and to 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 um, to um, help teachers with uh, with discipline um, and on the other side there's really um, some um, psychological work that teachers were doing 
on themselves um, to manage their own emotions and, and learn all these uh, sort of self-control and improve their self-control abilities. Um, so the intervention ultimately was, uh, was aimed at reducing user uh, teachers' use of, uh, of violent discipline, uh, but also to improve um, teacher well-being. Um, so before I move into the, um, the, the main study findings, I wanted to touch on um, sort of how the actual implementation of the, of the intervention uh, went. Um, so throughout that period between January and March 2019, um, the program team at the IRC faced a number of challenges. Um, and that um, resulted in, the in, uh, in having eight of, uh, of those 14 schools that received the intervention, eight of those received the intervention as it was originally um, designed over the original period of 10 weeks. So basically having a sort of one session per week um, plus two, two of those uh, uh, 12 sessions were a bit longer, um, so they counted as two, uh, two sessions. Um, because of some of these, these, uh, these challenges um, that, that took place during the implementation period, in six of the, of the intervention schools, some groups of teachers actually um, were disassembled and reassembled. So they, um, they were paused for a bit and uh, um, had to uh, receive the intervention over a more compressed period of time. Um, so some teachers in these schools some groups of teachers in these in these six schools received the intervention over a period of six weeks instead of um, eight, 10 weeks. They still received the same content, but we they obviously had a bit less time to uh, maybe do the homeworks and digest all the learning um, that was taking place within within that period of time. Um, in terms of attendance, uh, throughout the, 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 the program, we saw uh, reasonable levels of attendance, but um, I would say still quite suboptimal to compare to what we um, ideally imagined. Um, so we had about uh, slightly more than 80% of teachers attended, attended at least half of the, of the group sessions, which is, yeah, as I was saying, not, not, not great, um, but also reasonable given the challenges that teachers face within this context. Um, but we also observed the, um, big gaps in terms of homework completion and timeliness. Um, and as I mentioned before, homework completion and, and the practice um, at home and in the school um, of, the, of, these, uh, of these learnings was a quite important component uh, of the intervention to really um, allow, um, allow um, for, for a solid adoption of these strategies through uh, testing and trial um, by, by teachers. So as we move to the uh, sort of our main findings, um, before um, we look at the, our main outcomes uh, in terms of uh, students' experiences of, uh, of violence, um, I wanted to say we also measured a number of intermediate outcomes that we imagined would be on the pathway to change um, um, towards reducing um, levels of violence. And these were primarily um, outcomes that we, um, we measured in teachers and that we were expecting to observe in teachers. Um, and uh, we see some positive, um, positive uh, uh, results in terms of these intermediate outcomes for teachers. So teachers in intervention schools um, uh, use the more uh, of the of the alternative or positive disciplinary strategies um, that they were being obviously um, taught. Um, they reported attitudes that were less supportive of violent discipline. So we start to see we started to see some like change in, in, in attitudes and acceptability of violence in intervention schools. And they also reported better um, self control. Um, so you kind of see here. Um, all three improvements across all three components in a way of the of the intervention. However, the chain, the, the, the differences that we uh, observed between intervention and control schools were very small um, and probably too small uh, to uh, trigger or result uh, in um, lower levels of violence. Because actually when you when we look at our main outcomes and here you're seeing um, main outcome of 
um, students' experiences of physical violence in the past week and the students' experiences of emotional violence in the past week, we were actually unable to detect any significant, statistically significant difference between um, uh, schools in treatment and controls, uh, control groups, uh, both at midline and endline. So while we see some improvement on those intermediate outcomes for teachers, they didn't lead uh, to changes in the levels of violence that children experience that they, and that you can see are fairly uh, high with half of the, teach, half of the students um, reporting um, experiences of physical violence in the past week and about 20% of students reporting um, ex experiences of emotional violence in the past week. Um, so, our main conclusion is that we were unable to um, detect any um, uh, any significant effect on of of, of the empathy intervention um, in uh, in. Uh, for our um, other secondary outcomes. So when we think about student depression um, and um, school attendance, and I'm just checking that you can still hear me because I, my, I'm getting a message that my internet is unstable. Okay. Um, we also uh, looked at, uh, did the, some exploratory analysis to try and account for different levels of intervention um, uh, for intervention delivery um, intensity. Um, so we looked at whether schools that had received the, uh, more intensive deliveries where attendance rates were, were higher, for example, had the, uh, lower levels of violence. And again, we did not see um, any association between the, the uh, intensity of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of delivery of the intervention and our, um, our study outcomes. So um, before I kind of carry on and um, discuss a bit sort of these findings and what they mean for us, um, given that we are in a process working closely with our partners at the International Rescue Committee and at the Behavioral Insights Team and thinking how this intervention can be, um, can be changed and altered and improved, um, I would like to um, ask all of you as experts um, in this field to, to basically give me um, some suggestions. So I, um, I think you will now be um, allocated to um, different breakout rooms um, where I would really, where you should have also a link to a Jamboard. A Jamboard is a, a, a white sheet that allows you to take notes and make comments and just write down ideas, thoughts, words that come up in your conversations. And while we will not have the chance to discuss them together, I will bring them home. Um, and they will be very, uh, very helpful notes for, for, for me and the, the rest of the PIVAC team as we discuss. Um, so I would like to ask you, based on what, you, what, what I've told you so far and based on your um, knowledge in, the, in this field, how do you think the empathy intervention could be improved to achieve uh, impact? And when we mean impact, we talk, we, we obviously mean um, lowering levels of teacher, teacher violence. And this may uh, have to do with the content or with the reflections on the structure or the delivery model um, that, that I mentioned so far. Um, I will try and join the English speaking group um, because that's my preferred language, um, but I'll see you, I think, back in a few minutes. Yeah, so the rooms are ready to go. Um, not very many people renamed themselves with their languages, so the groups are just going to be random. I have put the link in the chat for everyone to click on and open up. You'll be sent into breakout rooms, and please just pick which slide at the top. You'll have the option to pick your slide um, for whichever group you're in. So if you're in breakout room one, you're group one, breakout room two, you're group two. And uh, Julie, please do uh, send everybody off. See you back in about six minutes. You should have all received an invitation to move you into a room. If you're having trouble moving, just let us know and we can try and help you. Speakers and facilitators, I originally didn't put you in rooms and then I thought, meh, 
I might as well. So you can <laughs> move yourselves around anyway. <laughs> I, I let them. I let them know if they didn't want to go, they could just ignore the invitation. Yeah, so. <laughs> that's cool too. <laughs> um, but how are we look in with everyone else? Uh, there's a couple folks that have not yet fully joined. Let's just see if they're having. I was going to say I would maybe move Cheryl, move Cheryl in room four because it doesn't look like anyone in that group has joined. Yep. No problem. Maybe put her if you put her in room seven. That's a good yeah. size. Good. Cool. Thank you. Now we look, and we got three and seven. Yeah. And I oh, so now there'll be four, three and two. I can't see that way. Five, four, five. Yeah. Five. Good. I was gonna say it looks like everyone. Joined. Nice. Yeah, we got a small handful that are uh, switched off. If any of you who are still in here and would like to go in, just turn your cameras on or unmute yourself and we can help you scooch into your breakout. Julie, is that Colin typing away? It is. I'll mute myself. <laughs> I was like, who is that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can I just ask, it's the same breakouts for the next round, right? Exactly the same. So five to six people, five and a half minutes. Julie, how many groups are there? There are now six. There were seven, but we've got six running. Um, and it's the same, I think for, is that three? Did I just count or did I just count two? I just quickly... There's three in total. Three okay, and they're all the same. In which case, Kat, you should be able just to recreate Cool. The same one. So just like, yeah. you know, don't start from, yeah, yeah, you know. And sorry, Laura, what was your question? Oh, no, no. I just quickly popped the um, instructions on each slide so that they had it right on their slide and Jamboard. Fantastic. Um, Thank you. I know how many I was doing. No, that's wonderful. Cool. So Kat, I'll wait till this closes and then I'm going to leave it with you to open the next time. You shouldn't have to do anything. You just reopen yeah. the exact same ones. And then I'm going to go and work on tomorrow's sessions. <laughs> <laughs> I believe in you. You have so much ability. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're I needed welcome. that. It's very stressful. Thanks so much, Julie, for everything you're doing. <laughs> oh, thank you, Laura. <laughs> and Katrina. <Yeah>. <laughs> Power team. Um, I'm going to write, don't forget to use the jam boards not much is being written on the jam boards yeah group one has a little bit oh i'm gonna give them a one minute warning as well yes good show that was so fast right five minutes goes way too fast to see when, you, much. when you're having fun <laughs> when you're brainstorming and um laura were we able to communicate to um to camilla that we're running quite over time I sent her a message, but I don't know if she saw it because she went into the breakout room at right after. Okay, it so should still be in her chat. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to think of how to how to be able to tell her without telling everyone. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Laura, as a facilitator, if you want to just maybe intro the next bit before Camilla can speak and just say, we're running over time now, so we're going to have to keep this bit moving forward. Yeah. And, and let that be her indication. <laughs> yeah. I probably walk walk one back and then. Yeah. And then if necessary, Kat can always spotlight you as well. And that's really kind of like the. <laughs> yeah. Giving, it makes you pop up them on the hook. Yeah. Oh, look, I have company in spotlight. I should probably move on. Great. That's our subtle. That's our subtle reminder to people <laughs> that they've gone over. Yeah. Great. So, and so Toby will be next. Yay. Cool. Closing in 15 seconds. I'm going to turn my video off and very subtly leave. So Goodbye. good luck for the rest of the session. Merd, enjoy. Have fun. <laughs> See you all in the next. Bye. Bye. <laughs>
All right, so Laura, in about five Hello. seconds, you'll have everybody back. Great. Hi. Welcome back, everyone. It's great to see you again. Thank you so much for engaging in the breakout room discussions. Uh, we just have a few uh, less than a minute to wrap up this session um, before we move on to the next presentation. So I'll just hand it back to Camilla to conclude. Um, and we can go to the last. Okay, so I hope you've had, I have had a, a quite um, interesting conversation in my group. I hope that um, you've managed to, to speak a bit about sort of what your thoughts are. Um, what we found uh, and what we think are um, the main reasons why um, empathy did not succeed in lowering um, levels of teacher violence um, is because of a mix of contextual intervention design and delivery factors. So in terms of contextual factors, just briefly, um, this, uh, this is a camp where there are very high levels of hunger. Um, so despite be, it being a protracted crisis where you would imagine the service provision of for, to, to, to fulfill basic needs would be, um, would be um, at, a, at, a, at a good level, um, uh, hunger is a massive problem. Um, and that obviously compromises teacher's ability to really fully engage in any other sort of extracurricular activity that happens within in their in their own um, sort of free time because this intervention was taking place after school hours teachers had to dedicate some of their extra time to this and when you're constantly hungry and that need to be uh, bothered about need to be thinking about how to feed your family all the time obviously your interest for all these uh, uh, extra activities could be could be uh, limited. Um, we also know that teachers in this context had uh, have other employments and other other activities that they perform. Um, so definitely, uh, they may have seen this as a bit of a waste of time and 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 have, may have focused uh, uh, primarily on uh, um, engaging in, in income generating activities uh, during their spare time rather than engaging in, in, in other um, school, school related um, work. Uh, at the same time, the intervention was uh, informed by cognitive behavioral uh, therapy. And uh, um, as, you've, as I told you, uh, the intervention really um, asked the teachers to uh, engage and start and embark in a process of, of psychological change in, in how they perceive themselves, but also how they perceive students and so, and so on. And uh, requiring all teachers um, within uh, in intervention schools to embark in this um, um, may have been uh, may have ignored their um, actual um, interest in, in embarking in a process like this where you need to be mentally ready um, to to do so um, in terms of uh, um, design factors um, I've tried here to summarize what we based on our learnings what are sort of main suggestions for others who may be in this in this space uh, thinking about how to design school-based uh, violence prevention interventions well first we learned that only focusing on teachers we basically ignoring other levels and other stakeholders at the school level um, was not uh, was not successful um, so in in involving parents, discipline teachers, head teachers, headmasters, and making sure that there is a, um, um, a, a school level of school wide support that basically can, can support the process of institutionalizing those new practices and those new strategies um, is really important. Um, again, um, understanding what, what are teacher priorities in a specific setting and framing the intervention around those priorities and the, basically marketing the intervention around what teachers need um, is really important. Um, we also realized that um, the lack of ex external and expert facilitation um, was definitely something that may have hindered um, the success of the of the intervention relying solely on teachers and and self uh, guided work um, was probably a bit uh, um, optimistic um, in, a, in a context like this one obviously the intervention was designed to be adapted settings where there's a there's a lot of in uncertainty and insecurity uh, but um, and, and and we needed something like touch and, uh, and cheap to deliver as well um, but the external um, facilitation was something that uh, um, was uh, was considered in the end uh, an important 
uh, gap for this intervention. At the same time, the lack of continued support and mentoring, reinforcing um, and supporting the, the adoption of these new strategies and, and supporting teachers in this like very complex uh, change process um, was also something that we think uh, may have affected um, our, our results. Um, and finally, as I said, that this was tried, this was intended to be very brief and light touch, to be flexible, an intervention that you can export ideally to other humanitarian contexts. Um, but um, again, probably this 10 week period was too brief. Um, um, and, 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 the engage, and you need like a much longer in deep, deeper engagement uh, with teachers um, and to support them um, throughout a, a fairly complex process where they not only need to learn new strategies, but where we expected them to really work within their own um, um, cognitive uh, um, mindset and, and psychological um, uh, structures. Um, Thank so you very much, Camilla. <laughs> All right, we really need to move on to the next presentation. Right. Thank you so much for, for that fantastic presentation and uh, really engaging to, to think about the, the project. Um, and we're gonna move on now to uh, the next presenter. I wanna introduce Toby Mbaya from Plan International Nigeria. Uh, she's a passionate and experienced educator who enjoys working with children, teachers, parents, and the larger community including government stakeholders to provide quality education in different con contexts. And so she's presently living in Northeastern Nigeria um, and managing a three-year Canadian funded project called Educating Vulnerable and Hard to Reach Girls and Adolescent Girls in Northeastern Nigeria. Uh, so welcome Toby, who will guide us through a presentation on gender transformative approaches. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Laura. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Toby Mbaya, and I'll be talking about gender transformative approaches to prevent child protection risk in education programs. And um, we'll be focusing on a, a project that is presently being implemented in Northeast Nigeria, specifically Borno and Jubi. But before we proceed, I would like us to take a short poll. All right. So if we can, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Kat. If we can click um, the link that is um, in the chat box. So using one word, what's your state of mind right now? I would really love to hear from each and every one of us. So if you can click um, on the link that is in the chat box. Engage, yay. Frazzled, oh dear. <laughs> Curious, confused. Oh, calm, modeled, very motivated, trusted, calm, excited. This is really interesting. Happy, passionate, need coffee. I wish I could share my own cup of coffee right now. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. And um, for our colleagues that are confused, I hope you're able to get answers as we go through these sessions. A bit low on energy, oh dear, multitasking. I can imagine, uh, I guess all of us are working in really, really um, high paced um, environment or contexts. Happy, comfortable, open minded, sleepy, you need a cup of coffee. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Um, can we go to the next question? How many, uh, how many hours a day do you spend online on a Zoom call? or on a team score, <laughs> depends on which one. So, and this is the same link, just so everyone yes. knows. There's gonna be three questions in total on the same link, so you can just use the same one. Thank you, Kat. Five hours, okay. Let's see which one is winning. I've lost count, two to five hours. Ooh, it's interesting. Okay, the pie is moving. It seems two to five hours is winning. Two hours, I can see someone from the Maureen in the chat. Thanks, Maureen. I've lost count, five to eight hours, okay. Well, it looks like two to five hours is um, the champion in this poll right now. <laughs> okay, it's shifting. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Kat. Good, so the final question, like um, Kat's mentioned, is still the same link. And this is the final question in this category. What are common barriers adolescent girls face in humanitarian contexts? So let's go ahead and answer. Thank you. 
Mm -hmm. Safety. Yeah, social norms are prepared traits, gender inequality, discrimination, sexual abuse, and violence, access to education, harassment, mm -hmm. intervention not tailored to their needs. Yeah. Social norms is winning, seems to be winning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Child marriage, someone mentioned in the comment section, GBV, access to services, abuse. Wow. Exclusion, including disability ex inclusion, that is key. Male dominated um, societies, social norms, yes. Voices not heard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not being taken seriously. Priority for the male, sexual abuse, forced marriage, lack of engaging them to participate. Uh -huh. PSEA, social economic normative barriers. Wow, yes, yes. This shows that we're very much aware of the barriers adolescent girls face in humanitarian contexts. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Kat. Uh, yes. So we're going to head right into the slide presentation. So um, this project, Educating Vulnerable and Hard to Reach Girls and Adolescents in Northeastern Nigeria project is designed specifically to address gender inequalities and tackling the roots, causes, and barriers, including forms of sexual and gender-based violence that prevents girls from attending and staying in school in two conflict-affected states. From the map, you can see that we're implementing in Yobe and Bornu. And then these, um, these states are actually in northeastern Nigeria. And the project is being implemented across six local governments. Yes, yes. Now, the project strategy that um, we're uh, uh, the project is at adopting is number one addressing gender barriers at the individual household and community level uh, which enable which is enabling an increase in demand for education and then the second one is uh, addressing supply and quality challenge in the formal and non in the formal and non-formal schools to help girls and boys in these communities to access appropriate pathways. So basically, we're looking at the demand aspect, which is addressing gender barriers at the, at the individual level, and that involves household and the community level, and then addressing also the supply of quality education, that is working with the larger community, working with teachers, um, the community stakeholders, and government stakeholders. Now, um, from the earlier activity that we had where everyone was uh, able to identify key barriers, um, the same thing too, through a baseline um, assessment that was conducted at the beginning of the project, we're able to identify five key barriers. Number one is peer environment. And at this level, uh, what we identified is that although at it, Adolescent girls are to a large extent aware of their rights, but the awareness is not fully shared by adolescent uh, boys. As such, this exposes them to harm or um, to harm to protection risk. Then we have household gender norms. These gender norms are damaging. Some of them can be damaging and some are not, but however, the damaging ones indicate acceptance of protection threats to girls and they are strongly held in target community. Now, these, house, these harmful gender norms are also held at the community level. And so you can imagine, especially these, um, some of these norms are tied to the beliefs about the roles of men and women, including girls and boys. Another um, um, protection risk is financial constraints due to the lack of um, resources. And this is as a result of the general um, crisis or the context, um, which is a conflict afflicted um, context. And then of course we have the impact of COVID-19. There's major uh, lack of resources as one of the primary barriers to education. And as such, what we end up seeing is that um, resources, the limited resources that are available are pushed towards um, educating the boys. And then girls are exposed to also very harmful um, survival, harmful survival skills and rest such as hawking and you know, also being exposed to so many um, gender-based violence or protection risk. Then we have protection risks due to, um, excuse me, 
Protection is due to conflict and other factors. Girls are more likely to more likely than boys to feel unsafe on the way to school. This was strongly highlighted in the um, um, poll that we had, and this is um, due to factors primarily associated with conflicts and insecurity. These risks are gendered, with girls likely to face kidnapping and rape. Now I would want us to go into our breakout rooms. Um, Katrina will be supporting with that. And in our groups, I want us to identify or discuss two ways in which these barriers can be addressed in an education context. Now we've identified this risk. Let's bring our minds to an education context. This could be the a formal school or a non-formal school. How do we address these barriers? Over to you, Katrina. Thank you. Welcome back, Toby. Everyone is just in the process of coming back. They should be back in about 10 seconds or so. Um, as we discussed earlier, did you want me to share one of the Jamboards first? Yes, please. Okay, great. All right, and everyone is back now. Okay, welcome back everyone. So, um, I hope you all had fruitful deliberations or discussions. Katrina is showing us one of the Jamboards, and then we have, I'm going to read out some of the points from the discussion. We have teacher training and coaching and mentoring on gender equitable attitudes and teaching practices. Um, okay, and then we have life skills, MHPSS referral systems, work with boys and men. These are really good ideas. Um, do you want to quickly show us another Jamboard if we have any? Um, yeah, so we have play because it's an opportunity to be with peers, play and learn, importance of non-formal education and work with boy and men of the community. Thank you very much, everyone, for these valuable contributions. Um, Katrina, can we go back to the slides? Thank you. Yes, so... Um, Basically, how we have um, structured our response to the risks that we have identified, prevention risks that we have identified is at two levels. We have at the individual level, targeted at the girls, their um, parents, you know, and their close, their immediate environment. And then we have at the community level. For the girls, what we have, uh, we have life skills training for adolescent girls and boys. And this um, training looks at um, building the capacity of girls and boys on their rights, um, self-awareness and the likes of it. And then we have provision of financial support and vouchers for adolescent girls. We're looking at addressing the issue of uh, financial constraints, which has been identified as a barrier. Then adolescent girl-friendly discussion groups and girls' school clubs. Now, these adolescent girls, um, these adolescent girl-friendly discussion groups are for out of school girls. And then we have the girls school clubs for in school girls. Then parenting sessions for parents and caregivers of adolescents. This is very important because at this level of all this activity, we're looking at addressing the harmful gender norms that parents or caregivers have at the household level. At the community level, we have um, trainings for community leaders for women organizations and religious leaders to support girls' education and delay marriage. We also have community level dialogues. We have community level um, dialogues with uh, our community leaders also and key or influential people within the community. And then of course we have, uh, we develop and broadcast um, social behavioral change communication messages. These are broadcasted through um, radio programs, um, living calls or living discussions or live discussions and the like of them. And of course, most importantly among this, or one of the important key things is training of teachers on gender responsive pedagogy, psychosocial support and the likes of it. For this training, we're, look, we're adopting the gender responsive um, pedagogy teacher training and of course um, the psychosocial support is a general manual that has been developed with the support of uh, different INGOs and the state government. Now what are the outcomes? Is, um, we're beginning to see that our stakeholders are having critical dialogues on barriers to education including child early and forced marriage 
So that is something that I want to have. A lot of times, some of the challenges are kept at a hush, hush level. Our community leaders do not want to talk about them or even address them. So beyond having conversations, they're also working on action plans and the projects with the support of implementing partners are following up on the action points. Also, parents are currently learning how to understand and support adolescents um, better through the parenting program. Then, of course, for our adolescent girls and boys, their capacities are being built around basic life skills and learning about their rights. What are the challenges? Of course, we have um, COVID-19. Um, due to COVID-19, we're unable to start a lot of our interventions. However, now that we have started implementation fully, we're seeing low participation from female stakeholders in trainings meetings and workshops as a result of prevailing gender norms in the project locations. What we are doing right now is using gender responsive or gender um, responsive languages um, in sending out letters and communicating with our stakeholders to see that women are supported to come into our meetings. And then also we're having discussions to identify timings that work for them. Also, um, findings from baseline and discussion with community stakeholders revealed that COVID-19 pandemic has increased the burden of care on women and girls. This also um, is um, linked to the first one of low participation. Then recruitment and engagement of female community mobilizers from each target community has also posed a challenge. This has made us to, this has, an, um, um, it has made the recruitment processes really burdensome and really long longer so you keep advertising and re-advertising but we keep working with our stakeholders to ensure that we have female participation at the community level then active involvement and participation of girls and young women living with disabilities in the project was also a challenge due to existing social structural and systemic uh, barriers but we're working together with all the different stakeholders to see that we actively seek out um, children living with disability, especially girls, and then support them in joining our meetings and also providing gender responsive, um, um, gen sorry, excuse me, um, disability friendly um, structures within the schools, such as latrines and um, wash uh, materials. Apologies, everyone. <laughs> There you go. Thank you very much. So one of the lessons learned that we have um, seen on the project is that working with community structures provides an opportunity for community members to fully participate. And of course, uh, we mentioned that um, one of the another key lesson learned is constantly engaging with women, adolescents, girls, hearing their voices to plan and implement our projects, and then working closely with communities regarding child protection issues and other issues enables them to see the role they have in dealing with these issues. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, thank you, Katrina, for the support. So just in conclusion, um, this is a new area, gender transformative child protection programming. I know that we're aware of the need to address social and gender norms at the root causes. And um, it would be important for us to see that uh, gender transformative approaches in education is strengthened. Thank you. Thank you so much, Toby, for that presentation and for for highlighting some of the key interventions that are working and not, um, we know that adolescents, um, adolescent girls and the challenges they're facing have even been exacerbated during COVID. So this is just such critical issues. So thank you. Um, now we'll move on to our final presentation. So I want to introduce you to Ala Raja Mugrabie, and she has an international public health background and has worked in child protection and emergencies for over four years. She's currently works with um, HURAS Network for Child Protection. She's the child protection specialist um, in Syria, and she works to improve the quality of programs for children living in conflict and other emergencies. Uh, she develops technical content for the organization and supports research and all types of uh, webinars and trainings. So welcome, Ala. We are looking forward to, your, to what you have to share with us. Thank you, Laura. And I would like to thank all my colleagues for their um, uh, presentations. And I will use them to build on um, my presentation. Um, I will be presenting um, uh, using behavioral change theory, uh, the COMBI model. Uh, to reduce violence against children in Northwest Syria uh, schools. Um, this has 
uh, been uh, a joint um, effort between uh, uh, me and Nikki. Uh, uh, she was supposed to be presenting with me, but uh, she couldn't. Uh, so Nikki uh, works with Kimonex as a senior male and research specialist. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so just to give you a bit of uh, context, um, corp uh, corporal punishment and humiliation and other forms of negative discipline techniques are common practices uh, for classroom management in Syria, and they are perceived as acceptable responses by teachers. Um, uh, so our project, uh, our objective was to uh, create a safe and inclusive and quality learning op opportunities for children uh, while supporting education actors to effectively manage uh, education. Uh, so we have been doing before this research some uh, work. Uh, with FCDO in partnership with Manahil and Kimonex uh, to uh, reduce the uh, uh, prevalence of uh, uh, violence against children in schools. And this research has, uh, has been conducted after uh, uh, conducting other interventions and research to introduce a behavioral change um, uh, positive discipline uh, teaching techniques and um, uh, uh, some law enforcement of uh, um, uh, negative discipline, uh, punishment, and etc., just to reinforce the positive discipline teaching. In this research, we try to um, uh, we uh, conducted an action ra a rapid action research to test the uptake of positive discipline teaching uh, techniques and how uh, teachers uh, are perceiving those techniques um, and whether uh, it's. Um, it will reduce the um, uh, violence against children in schools. Uh, we conducted this uh, uh, research in nine schools uh, uh, with 127 uh, education actors. And uh, it was uh, from February, uh, February to March um, uh, in Northwest Syria uh, schools. So before I uh, go on into the, um, uh, the research, I want to introduce a bit of um, 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 introduction into uh, the behavioral change combi model that we used for the research. Uh, so we start with the actor-based uh, representation of system dynamics. So let's say if we are discussing a negative discipline uh, behavior, so we had to uh, first um, uh, I'd address the problem. Um, I think there's an animation here we can click so we can see. Yeah, so the problem have been addressed. Then we had to address the actors. Uh, it was teachers, head teachers. We had to uh, also uh, see that the, communi uh, the community uh, and social norms were some of the actors associated with the problem. <clears throat> Then we had to um, uh, see the behavior, which is negative discipline, and uh, see how they interacted and influenced one each, uh, another. So we had the lead teacher and the head teacher. Um, and of course, we had to uh, study the system boundaries to uh, see how we are going to uh, uh, apply the combi model. So, um, um, uh, we have to, uh, when we are applying the active based representation of system dyna dynamics, we, we first start with the activities and we see the benefits that they are going to uh, produce. And uh, uh, we see the reaction to these activities and see the capacities, changes in knowledge, attitudes, and skills. Uh, after we, uh, that, we study the behavior change and we see if there is a benefit and whether it's sustainable or not. So the combi model, uh, it studies the behavior and it's a hypothesis that um, uh, the behavior is influenced by the capabilities, motivation and opportunities. Uh, capabilities meaning the physical, psychological and physical ability to, um, uh, to 
do the behavior and the motivation is reflective and autonomic uh, mechanisms that uh, activate or inhibit the behavior and opportunities uh, that are physical and social uh, that uh, environment that affect the behavior itself. Uh, you can look further into the combi model um, uh, study that uh, uh, I can uh, later on uh, attach. Okay, so uh, based on what we uh, I have um, explained on the combi model, just to um, uh, uh, and, and ensure that you have uh, understood it. We will, are going to make a cup of tea uh, using the uh, capabilities, opportunities, and motivation uh, to study the behavior of uh, making uh, or drinking a cup of tea. Uh, now you will have a link to a Padlet and you will be in, uh, uh, in groups in groups discuss uh, the capabilities, motivation, and opportunities that will lead to the behavior of drinking a cup of tea or the behavior not drinking a cup of tea. And you will have five minutes to do that. So each group can uh, uh, add only one uh, example uh, to each of uh, the um, capabilities or opportunities or motivation. Welcome back. <laughs> All right. Hope you enjoyed making a cup of tea. Yeah, <laughs> Over to it was you, really interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Perfect. You Thanks, still have, there's still a few people coming back, so just give it one moment. Okay. Uh, that should be everyone there now. Okay, so uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, hope you enjoyed your cup of tea. Um, just to ha have a, like a wrap up on the activity. So uh, some, there are some great examples on the Padlet, like uh, the capabilities. Uh, do I understand uh, how to make a cup of tea? Do I have the time? Um, do I know how to make a cup of tea? And about the opportunities, like uh, do I have a kettle? Do I have uh, the tea? Uh, do, I have, uh, do I have electricity or heating? Is it um, socializing? Uh, opportunity for me to make a cup of tea and for the motivation uh, like uh, maybe the health reasons will not motivate me or motivate me to have the cup of tea or maybe I enjoy having a, uh, having a cup of tea maybe I don't see the benefit of making uh, a cup of tea so I will not making, uh, make it and these are great examples of the combi model and how to use it to understand the behavior in, in this case is making a cup of tea or not making the a cup of tea. So maybe we can now return to our slide. Huh? So to go back to our uh, research and um, uh, so uh, after we studied the system uh, and uh, uh, discussing the behavior, which was a negative discipline, uh, we have uh, rounded up our questions, research questions around uh, what are the type of uh, students' behavior that resulted in teacher discipline? Uh, what do teachers preserve, preserve those uh, um, behaviors? Uh, do they see that there are uh, causes to those behaviors that they, we can uh, prevent? Uh, to what extent do participating teachers take up specific techniques uh, introduced in each cycle? So in each cycle, we introduce the new um, uh, 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 techniques or um, positive discipline techniques. So, so to what extent they use it, uh, why some of the techniques they didn't use it, etc. Uh, which factors influence teacher uptake and continued use and why? Um, and to what extent does participation in the program activities influence teacher attitudes uh, about the use of negative discipline and why? So uh, the research approach uh, was after we studied the st system dynamics and we studied the factors for the teacher that led to um, 
the negative test plan, uh, uh, we designed the cycle on three uh, stages. The first stage, uh, uh, they will have um, a, um, a seminar or a workshop for one day uh, that will introduce the new techniques for positive discipline. And uh, uh, they will have the opportunity to, uh, to train themselves on those uh, uh, new techniques. Afterwards, they were asked to um, have a peer study uh, similar to what Camila was discussed, that uh, peer uh, support was uh, uh, influential for uh, teacher taking up a positive discipline uh, technique and behaviors. Later on, they were uh, asked to uh, do a group of learning circles uh, to discuss the, uh, the cycle, what has happened, what are the positive aspects of the techniques they used, what are the negative or the challenges that they used. So the following the eight standards of the CPM, the inter intervention supported teachers in the first place and the lead teacher and the head teachers in the second place to use positive discipline techniques and decrease the use of negative behaviors like hitting, shaming and shouting. Teachers were provided with awareness session, as I said, then uh, followed on with the rest of the uh, cycles. Uh, in the beginning or in the initial design of the study, uh, head teachers were not part of the study, but after we have done the um, uh, interview and the baseline, uh, uh, we saw that the head teachers are uh, uh, a big uh, motivation matter to the teachers to uptake uh, the uh, positive behavior. So teacher, head teachers were asked to support the teachers in the shift of using techniques uh, of their own and supporting the teachers to use their uh, positive, positive techniques as well. So here you can see the uh, design. We started with the uh, uh, baseline. We did some interviews and we did a, a, cap, uh, a CAP questionnaire uh, on uh, their uh, attitudes and knowledge of um, uh, uh, negative discipline. Uh, then they had the first uh, cycle and the learning circle. Uh, we had did, uh, some uptake questionnaire just to see uh, what are the techniques they liked the most and how to design this next cycle. The next cycle um, uh, uh, then followed and uh, in the end of the second cycle, uh, we did the uh, end line and the interviews. So we did this to use negative discipline with, with children and shifted to using positive discipline with children, which is the needed behavior. Uh, when we study the underlying behavioral th theories for teachers, uh, when we see the capabilities for using negative discipline, the lack of knowledge and skills, and we uh, use this and to uh, increase the knowledge with the booklets and the awareness raising and the understand of reasons of children uh, behavior and the uh, opportunities, they lack the space and permission to uh, apply new models of uh, teaching, also the culture of acceptance and denial of corporal punishment and the children's problematic behavior. Um, we changed that with the support from school leaders and culture positive discipline. For the, the motivation, we, uh, uh, we increased their better, uh, better toleration for children's behavior and less belief of uh, the efficacy of uh, 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 children's uh, 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 shaming and punishment. So um, uh, I will not go through uh, all of this. This is just to outline how the combi model was used uh, for the teachers and how we outlined the head teacher, the lead teachers, uh, how they applied the, uh, how they affected their motivation and the opportunities of, uh, and capabilities for teachers to use positive discipline um, uh, uh, more with the children and how this has affected the motivation and capabilities of children to be uh, to use the uh, re desired behaviors during classrooms. So um, quickly, I will wrap up uh, and uh, go into the research results. The type of behavior reported has uh, shifted. Um, just a second. Uh, so over the six weeks that uh, this targeted, the systematic approach seemed to work. We saw some behavior changes that, while not drastic, but 
seen the time uh, period of the study, it was uh, impressive. Uh, uh, and importantly, the, the belief of corporal punishment decreased a little in the teacher who participated um, in the study. Again, this is not significant, but uh, in the big picture, but uh, seeing the six weeks uh, interval of the study, it was. Uh, again, and the teacher who used uh, positive discipline techniques because they got posit positive responses from children, the positive responses motivated the teachers to continue using positive discipline. Uh, uh, as their capabilities improved, they became more comfortable with the new techniques. Um, also, uh, 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 as, as I said, the, their capabilities improved, they became more comfortable with the using the techniques that the children affected their motivation and their opportunity to use those positive discipline techniques we introduced. And at last, teacher were using positive discipline techniques after our research guided us to reinforce the skills, the skills, meaning the capabilities, and how others supported them, uh, meaning the opportunity, and they started using greater vari a variety of pos positive discipline techniques. Finally, the teacher perception of what children problematic behavior looked like shifted. So instead of seeing uh, talking uh, too much or uh, moving too much as a negative behavior, they only uh, use discipline on aggressive behaviors at the end of the study. Um, uh, so some, some takeaways uh, uh, for the time, as I explained, it was short period. Uh, for, for future researchers, we uh, suggest to have longer period and access. Uh, this has, uh, uh, since Harass Network is already uh, working with those schools, uh, so access to those uh, teachers and schools has permitted us to, to conduct this uh, research in a rapid way successfully and uh, we suggest to have more participatory uh, uh, engagement for the teachers, um, uh, some uh, understanding of the age and the technique we, we provided it need, needed more broadening and the sample size was uh, a, little bit, a little bit limited. Thank you so much, Ella, for that presentation. Um, and we've heard from, from three presenters from, from different contexts on integration and um, there's, it's been really stimulating hearing about uh, the need for education, health, and child protection to come together. Um, as we conclude in this last minute, follow that last link, please. The Menti um, link in the chat. It's just a fun um, last statement, just one word or phrase you'll leave with, and we can see that come up on the screen. Um, as you'll see in the chat, I, I did mention if you have any unaddressed questions, I didn't see many in the chat, but please do email me at the COVID-19 Alliance email address and I'll direct them to the presenters. So if you can all follow that last Menti link. So integration, multi-sector, gender transformative, Child protection and education is key. Innovation, role of teachers, absolutely critical. Um, so everyone is summarizing our presentations very well. So thank you again to our three presenters, um, to Camilla and Toby and Allah. Uh, you've brought so much richness to this conference and to our, our work and lives today. So thank you very much. And wishing you all a beautiful morning, afternoon and evening, depending on where you are. And we will take a 30-minute um, break before the next round of thematic sessions. So thanks again for joining us. Mm -hmm.